tonight we will be looking at the sacrifice in the epistles of Peter and Paul. <coughs> it will be a change in course a little bit. Instead of looking th simply through a chapter or two, we'll be skipping around quite a bit. And then next week we will be looking at Hebrews, which I guess arguably is written by Paul, but it deserves its week to its own since it speaks so much about the law and the sacrifices. I do want to add one thing to something we talked about last week. I We talked about Christ on the cross and how he uh, made sure to take care of Mary, his mother. <coughs> but I don't want anyone to think that we ascribe to her that she is the mother of God. <laughs> you know, that is definitely not biblical teaching. She was the fleshly mother, if you will, of Christ. She bore him. Yet she is well, just simply a woman chosen by God to do that thing. And she was not virgin until she died. She clearly had more children. <laughs> yeah, let's go on to our study here. We'll look in First Peter to begin with. So two passages in First Peter. Chapter 1, verse 18 through 21 will begin. First Peter chapter 1 verses 18 through 21. Here Peter says, For as much as ye know not that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in him. So here Peter tells us that we were not redeemed, as he calls them, corruptible things, such as silver and gold. You know, money and material possessions cannot redeem the soul. Many have tried to pay money, and we see it even in the scriptures that, I forget what's his name, Simon, that tried to pay money for the gift of God. Peter told him, thy money perish with thee. Right. Well, the gift of God can't be purchased with money. It doesn't matter if you have a dollar in the bank or a million dollars in the bank. It doesn't matter if you have a, thou <coughs> a thousand cars that are you know, worth more than my house or if you have one right. old pickup truck. We are not redeemed by those type of things. As he says here in the... Uh, Verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ. The blood of Christ is what redeems souls. And he calls it precious here. It's of great value. It's highly esteemed and honored, if you will. It's much more precious than gold and silver. Go ahead, brother. Um, something I've been thinking about, <laughs> and I, I would just love to hear your thoughts on the, the blood. The Bible calls it the precious blood. You might be familiar with the controversy that happened a couple years ago where people were talking about the blood. What are your thoughts on is there any significance in the physical blood itself, or do you think it's more so what the blood accomplished? I'd say it's probably more what the blood accomplished. Obviously, it was a sinless, unlike our blood, but I don't know if there's anything special in the blood itself. What's your well, I would, thing? Uh, I think it's both, <laughs> because it has to be the physical blood for a type into the Old Testament. And that was, I think, the reason that the soldier was inspired by God to punch the sword through his side. It was, if you recall that text, it says every drop. And in a sin sacrifice, it had to be the whole thing. And so I think it's both. I, I think that his blood was sacrificial. Yeah. But as close to our veins as ours, maybe not, because he, the Bible says, he was made in the likeness of sinful man. Well, I agree. It's what I mean. His blood accomplished for us, if you will. It, I just don't know that his. Beside that, he was sinless. I'm not sure there was anything special about the blood, if I can say it that way. <laughs> but we, as we'll see next week, he 
It's said to have applied his blood on the mercy seat of God. And he describes him here of a as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, which we know was the requirement under the law. We see chapters one of Levitic, Levitic excuse me, Leviticus chapter one, Leviticus chapter three, chapter four, chapter five, chapter six, all describe a lamb without blot with, with excuse me, without blemish and without spot. Sorry, I'm getting tongue tied tonight. Christ was a perfect lamb of God, if you will. He was, I think, physically perfect, but also spiritually perfect. Even more so, spiritually, he was without sin. He was had no blemishes in him. Right. It had to be so that he could fulfill the law. It had to be so that he could pay for our sins. He wasn't just a, you know, a good man, as some teach. Well, there's this teaching that he was died in his, as an example. No, he died for our sins. Amen. Verse uh, he was, excuse me. He says he was we were redeemed. That is, we were ransomed, if you will. We were freed by a payment. He paid the price for us. Acts twenty twenty eight says he had purchased his church with his blood. Right. Well, First Corinthians six twenty tells us we were bought with a price. And that price was the sacrifice of Christ, his blood being shed particularly. <laughs> Verse twenty says, Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. I don't know how some people come up with their theology, but it was very clear. And this verse and several others that Christ was foreordained is here. He was foreknown, if you will, to be the sacrifice for our sins before the foundation of the world. Not plan B. No, it wasn't that Adam and Eve messed it up and God had to go to plan B. Or I've even heard some say it was plan C or D because he tried the law out and that didn't work either. Uh, yeah. Of course, we see in the fullness of time he was manifest, and as he says, in these last times for you. Over and over, as we'll look through these scriptures tonight, we'll see it was for us. You know, it seems very clear to me that it wasn't for just anyone and everyone, but it was for a particular people. Verse 21 here he says, Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith? and hope might be in God. <laughs> Without the resurrection, we'd have no hope. Certainly his death paid the penalty, for, if you will, but his resurrection is vital, too, to our complete salvation or complete redemption that we might have hope in God, as he says here. <laughs> we have a hope that is steadfast and sure, not one as the world gives that's you know, maybe so, possibly, but no, we have a hope that actually has promise that it will be fulfilled. Right. Let's go on to chapter 2. Uh, chapter 2, verse 21. <laughs> says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. <laughs> Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed. <laughs> well, Christ suffered. We saw that over and over again throughout the Gospels. We saw it in type in the sacrifices, and we saw it prophesied throughout the Psalms and the Prophets. And he did leave us an example that we should follow in his steps, as he says here. You know, from his throughout his life, he lived a perfect example for us. And he even goes on to say here, "Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth." He was the perfect Lamb of God, as we saw. He was without sin, 
really it had to be if he was a sinful sacrifice he couldn't have paid for any of our sins could he right and it says neither was guile found in his mouth that's guile means deceit or trickery the Islamic God Allah they call him he is a deceitful God he He's allowed to deceive his people. He allo allows his people to deceive others. But Christ was not so. He was without deceit. He was without sin. He was perfect in every way. Amen. The next two verses here seem to reference Isaiah 53, especially verse 24. It says, Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again? When he suffered, or when he when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Christ completely submitted himself to what God would have for him. As a lamb was led to the, is led to the slaughter is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Isaiah fifty three seven says. You know they, over and over again they mocked him, they falsely accused him, they reviled him, they hit him, they did all manner of things which. He didn't deserve, yet we don't find him complaining. We don't find him threatening, as it says here. We don't find him rebuking them, even. Just simply committing himself to the sacrifice which he had to make. <laughs> Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. See, as I pointed out when we were in Isaiah, it was for our sins. Because we know he had no sins, and yet... It was not for all sin, but it was simply for our sin. <coughs> so that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Amen. You know, we were dead in sin, dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2 1 tells us. And yet Christ died that we might live. Amen. You know, we could get on a rant about dead men and what they can do and what they cannot do. But it's very clear in the scriptures that we were dead in sins. And except Christ had intervened, we would still be dead in our sins. Well, let's go on to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3. <laughs> oh, I, I had wanted to go from book to book, but... Lord led me otherwise to keep kind of a, at least a somewhat consistent train of thought throughout the lesson. So we'll begin here in Romans 3, verse 23. I'm sure a verse we all know. Through verse 25, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by, freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. We begins with all have sinned. As I often point out when I read this verse, it doesn't leave out any, does it? You know, all have sinned, not a single one has been without sin except Christ himself. <laughs> Yes, he is not including this all here. <laughs> For he was not a sinful man like us. <laughs> and he says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. <laughs> we see in Christ we are justified. Well, that means that we were declared innocent. I mean, some have said it's just, it, just as if I had never sinned. And really, that's what it is in Christ that we are as if we had never sinned. Right. And it's even better. Justification means a positive righteousness. Yeah, because then he imputes his righteousness to yeah, us. Not just innocent, but righteous. Yeah. And it says by his grace, not by anything else, is it? Amen. Not by works or not by our own doings, not by anything but the grace of God through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption we'll see over and over again. That is the full purchase of our souls by Christ. 
It says, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. We saw that verse last week in 1 John. It means that he was an appeasing of God for us. It was He was a satisfying sacrifice on our behalf. Through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. So this comes through faith. And it's here it's described in his blood. And that is in his finished work in his sacrifice. <laughs> you know, there's many different terms people use, but it's by his death that propitiation was made. And it says, declare his righteousness. As Brother Kenny pointed out, his, we have his righteousness now that we are in him. For the remission of sins that are past, you know, this remission is a different word than other times we see remission in the New Testament. Here is meant that it's been omitted from us. It's been passed over, if you will. Remission, though, is a New Testament teaching. You won't find it in the Old Testament. Right. In the Old Testament, their sins were covered, but they were never taken away. But in Christ, our sins are taken away. Our sins are removed from our record, if you will. Let's go on to chapter 5 of Romans. Chapter 5, verse 1, and then we'll skip down to verse 8 for time's sake. Chapter begins with, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we see this justification that we just talked about, how that we're justified by faith, not by works of the law, not by baptism, not by church memberships, but simply by faith in Christ. And he says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here and among other places, we'll see that he fulfilled the peace offering. They brought us peace with God. You know, before this, we were at we were described as being at enmity with God. We were contrary to God, if you will. We had no desire to be in fellowship with Him. Yet in Christ, we're brought into union with Him again, in agreement, if you will, with Him. Then he continues on in verse 8 to say, But God commends his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right. It was not that when we got good enough, Christ did a work for us. But Christ did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Amen. You know, There's a saying that God helps those who help themselves. I don't find that anywhere in the Bible. Amen. You know, I do believe we ought to do something for ourselves, in a sense, but not... When it comes to salvation, he accomplished what we can't accomplish. Right. <laughs> you know, we can't help ourselves, if you will, when it comes to saving our own soul. Right. <laughs> I, I do like, I think it was, I think it was Augustine that said, you know, man cannot cure himself of a toothache, yet he madly thinks that he can send his own power to cure his own soul. <laughs> While we were yet sinners, though Christ died for us. And he goes on to say, Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Well, as we'll see uh, in some verses in First Thessalonians, he has saved us from wrath. The message to flee from the wrath to come was goes all the way back to John the Baptist in Matthew 3, 7 and Luke 3, 7. We don't have to turn there, but he... He tells the Pharisees that who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Well, there's some de some people might debate about what this wrath is. Some might attribute it to the wrath of Revelation. Some attribute it to hell. And certainly, God has saved us from hell, if you will. But well, one thing many get wrong today is that was not. The main purpose of Christ saving us. <laughs> As he says here, much more than being now justified by his blood. You know, being saved from hell is a a call or a result, if you will, of salvation, but it's not the main purpose of it. Right. You know, I 
until I got laid off. I worked as a quality engineer, as most of you know, and a big part of my job was to find the root cause of problems. And the root cause of our problem was sin. And that's what had to be dealt with, sin. Uh, for he shall save his people from their sin, is what the angel told Mary. Or was it Joseph? I forget. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. I'm sure Joseph told Mary, though. Yeah. <laughs> we shall be saved from wrath through him, he says. So, yes, our sin is dealt with, but we receive so much more through Christ. Amen. He goes on to say in verse 10, For if when we were enemies, see, there's that enemies I was referring to, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. In his death, as he calls it here, we were reconciled. We were brought back into agreement or favor with God. <laughs> and this reconciled implies that a change had to occur. In our wicked and lost state, we couldn't be in agreement with God, could we? But he had to give us a new nature. He had to make us a new creature, as he calls us in First Corinthians. I uh, asked a question last week. Since we have been reconciled to God, what is the quote unquote responsibility that we have? Anyone th care to venture a guess on that? I assumed you were referencing the passage in 2 Corinthians 5. <laughs> yes. Since we've been given the ministry of reconciliation, if we are ambassadors for Christ and beseech others on his behalf to be reconciled. Yes, that is it. <laughs> in fact, I'll turn over there and read that for us. 2 Corinthians 5.18. Verse 17 is where it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So we had to make us a new creature when he reconciled us. And verse 18 says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. <laughs> so it is our... No, we can't physically reconcile people to God, but yet we can point to the one that can. And that's the ministry of reconciliation. Spreading the gospel, pointing people to Christ, that they might be reconciled to God, that they might be you know, brought back into favor and agreement with God. That's what the word reconcile means, to be brought back into agreement. But he says we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Like I said, in his death, he reconciled us, but by his resurrection, we will have life, he says. We shall be saved by his life. You know, I'd, if Christ had not rose, we would, I assume we could have been saved from hell, but we wouldn't have been able to have eternal life with God. I assume we would have had to go to a place like Abraham's bosom and Verse 11 says, not only so, so there's even more to, to it, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. This is a, the only time atonement is used in the New Testament. It is interesting that same word translated reconciliation in other places, but we see atonement throughout our study in Leviticus, though, how the Sins were atoned for through the sacrifices. As they were covered, they were purged. And so have we been by this, by Christ himself. We have been purged and brought back into favor with God once again. <laughs> that, that standing we had before the fall in Adam, that's been restored once again in Christ. <laughs> Let's go on to our next passage uh, in 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> 
we'll come back to Romans in a little bit. <laughs> Actually, here after a couple more scriptures. We could probably study the first eight chapters of Romans and, and see uh, all that comes to us through the death of Christ and, and how it is outweighed the law, if you will, how it was better than the law. Second Corinthians 5, verse 7 through 8. Excuse me. First Corinthians five verse seven through eight says, "Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth." We looked at the Passover in Exodus chapter twelve, and how we see here how it was fulfilled in Christ. And the sacrifice was to be a a lamb without blemish of the first year, and Christ was a lamb without blemish. In verse 6 of Exodus 12 tells us the whole congregation was to kill it in the evening. The whole congregation killed Christ, didn't they? I know he willingly gave up his life, but in another sense they killed him. They had him put to death. And he died in the evening. We know it was about the ninth hour. Then none of it was to remain until the next day. It was all to be consumed. Just as really Christ was completely consumed on the cross. All his blood was shed for us. All really physically he was all the way used up. Probably more than any human had been. And then when God saw the blood applied to the post and the lintel, he would pass over them. Verse thirteen of just the same when God sees the blood of Christ applied to us, he passes over us, if you will. He looks over the wickedness that was in us and looks to Christ instead. For even Christ, our Passover, sacrificed for us. And we, as we saw in the Gospels, he was sacrificed at the Passover. Let's go, we'll spend too much time here. Let's go on to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we'll look at Romans 8 after that. <laughs> this was right after where we just read about being a new creature and being reconciled to God and having the ministry of reconciliation. That chapter concludes with, For he, speaking of God, hath made him, speaking of Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Christ bore our sins, and even more so, he says he became sin for us. He, <laughs> when Old Testament sacrifices were offered, the offerer would lay their hands on the sacrifice, you know, in type, transferring their sin and identifying themselves with the sacrifice. Even more so, it says that Christ became sin for us. He literally took our sins away for us. You know, our sins were imputed to him and his righteousness imputed to us. But it says here, who knew no sin. As we pointed out numerous times already, Christ was this perfect sacrifice. He was not even the slightest sin was found in him. We even see that at his trial, they couldn't find anything that was actually his fault. They brought false accusations against him over and over and over again. But he had actually done no wrong, so they had to make up something. It says that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That in Christ we have his righteousness. That in Christ we have not our own righteousness, which is in itself defiled and sinful. We had the righteousness, which is of God. I would like to go on to Romans <laughs> chapter 8. Uh, change our focus for a moment and talk about the law for a minute. 
We'll look at that even some more next week in Hebrews. But Romans 8, verse 3 says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sent in his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. For lack of a better way of putting it, the main problem with the law was that it couldn't save anyone. And the main reason for that was because no one could keep it. Not even the best of men could keep the law perfectly. Right. It was weak through the flesh, he describes it here. But yet God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was not sinful flesh, but he... He looked like sinful flesh, if you will. I don't know how much man has degraded in time from Adam to now, but I imagine we do look a little bit different than the perfect Adam. But Christ in a body, God in a body, really, in him was all the fullness of the Godhead. It says God sent in his own son and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Christ doing what we could not do, perfectly keeping the law and condemned sin in the flesh. You know, I, I suppose God could have just spoken and it would have happened. You know, he could have took away our sins, but yet he came down and condemned sin. He really defeated it, sin for us. First uh, Corinthians fifteen fifty six tells us that the strength of sin is the law. Right. And Romans three twenty tells us by the law is the knowledge of sin. You know, the law in itself was not evil, but it showed us how evil we were. Right. It showed us how incapable we were of keeping it. Galatians three twenty four tells us it was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law was good at showing us how sinful we were and how much of a in need of a savior we were. But it couldn't save anyone, really. So he had no sin, though he says once again here, or it implies it, I guess you could say here, he was in the likeness of sinful flesh. He couldn't condemn sin in the flesh if he had been sinful himself. Let's uh, go over to Ephesians chapter 2, one of my favorite chapters. Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll begin in verse 11. We'll continue all the way down through verse 16. We'll, let's look through verse 13 to begin with here. It says, Wherefore remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Amen. We were the people, who, as Gentiles, who didn't have the law. We were outcast, if you will. We were even more so hopeless than the Jews were. We were without Christ, he says here. We were outside of Christ. We had no claim to him. We were com aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We were not part of Israel, neither spiritually nor physically. Well, they had the law. They had the promises that Christ would come. They had the oracles of God, as they're called. But as Gentiles, we had nothing. And he says, and strangers from the covenant of promise. We had no claim to the promises before we were saved <laughs> he says having no hope and without God in the world that's a pretty miserable condition isn't it mm -hmm. to have no hope at all and on top of that to be without God but so it was every last one of us before the Lord saved us and so it is everyone who continues on with not believing in Christ they have no hope, in, and they don't have God either. Well, they they might not realize it, but one day they'll realize it when they're cast alive into a, a lake of fire. 
always notice the buts in the scriptures. But now, he says, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off were made nigh by the blood of Christ. So we were afar off. We were nowhere close to God, but yet, he says, by his blood he made us nigh. He brought us close, if you will. Now we can lay claim to the promises in Christ. Now we are the people of God. Now we are in Christ, as he says here. Now we have that hope that is steadfast and sure. Now we're made at peace with God again. We're with union with him again. There's no no room for boasting in that. It was all through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's continue reading here in verse 14. He says, For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall partition between us, having abolished in his flesh enmity, even the law of commandments contained in, ordin contained in ordinances, for to make in himself a twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain enmity thereby. Again, we see he is our peace. That we have peace with God through Christ. And he says, Who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall partition between us. Both literally and figuratively. When we saw in the Gospels, Matthew and Mark particularly, that it says that the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. As if God himself had torn it in two. And now we have access directly to the throne of grace we no, we no longer we have to you know, cleanse ourselves to enter the temple and then have a priest go on our behalf but really we have direct access to God through our high priest which is Christ I don't see too many clear scriptures in verse 15 that talk about the abolishing of the ceremonial law in Christ having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. <coughs> there are some today that teach that we're still under the law. And there's a multitude of scriptures I could test differently, but yet if we were still under the law, we would really have no need for Christ, would we? But righteousness does not come by the law. In fact, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Right. As we'll see here in a moment, moment in Galatians. Yet, both Jew and Gentile have been reconciled to God through the cross. Both he who was under the law and he who did not have the law, even though all were really under the law. <laughs> and I would make an argument that outside of Christ, people are still bound to keep the law every last jot and tittle of it or let's go over to Galatians and continue on this thought of the law for a moment Galatians chapter 3 really the whole book of Galatians deals with this topic of the law Galatians 3 verses 10 through 13 we'll read here it says for as many or as of the works of the law are under the curse for it is written Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. See, that's why the law couldn't save, because no one could continue in all of the law. It says, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law. Because no one could continue in all things of the law. Verse 11 says, But that no man is justified by law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. So Christ took away the, the curse of the law. He says here, he says he... And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. I don't, my opinion based on other scriptures, that no man in the Old Testament was saved by keeping the law, but they had to have faith. 
But anyone who strives to keep the law for salvation, they're not of faith. <laughs> they, so it is with good works salvation today. It's really the equivalent. The only way that good works could save them is if they could perfectly do all good works and never sin. <laughs> now, I've often made the analogy of if you had a scale and your good works were over here in your right hand and your bad works were over here, the scale would always tip to the bad works. And really, outside of Christ, all your quote unquote good works are tainted by sin anyway. <laughs> Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. And we fulfilled the law in every way, even to the point of here, fulfilling Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 through 23, that says, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Right. And he hung on the tree, or the cross, as we call it sometimes, for our sins. But in doing so, he fulfilled even this part of the law and became a curse for us. Everything that we deserved was placed upon Christ. Everything that we deserved, he bore on our behalf. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <laughs> this is probably a somewhat familiar scripture, and at least topic, what we call the Lord's Supper or sometimes Communion. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26. It says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood, this do ye, as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. That we know that they ate the Passover and with the leftovers, if you will, they Christ instituted the Lord's Supper. Unleavened bread and and wine. Not this unfermented wine, whatever that is. <laughs> but no he but really we see in this the fulfillment as we saw back in Leviticus of the meat offering and the drink offering. How that this unleavened bread was broken and offered to God, which is was his body. His body, as he says here, was broken for you. Christ was literally broken for us. Not that a bone was broken in his body, but <laughs> In every sort of way, he was broken down. Right. And then the cup, as he calls it here, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. When they drink all of it, the Gospels tell us. All of his blood was used up. All of his blood was poured out as the drink offering was. And yet we have the blessed privilege of in type showing his death till he comes you know, as often as you drink it as often as you do it do it in remembrance of me he says you know, the meat offering was also to be a, a memorial a remembrance he also says as the Lord's Supper is to be a remembrance for us of what Christ has done for us how he suffered for us and how we ought to do it says here till he come well, I don't know if things will get more difficult for us in coming years I'm sure they will but even if we have to meet on a field somewhere we ought to still right. do the Lord's Supper we ought to still show that he died for us and we remember that <laughs> let's go back to the book of Ephesians once more look at two verses or here Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 to begin with. It says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Once again, we see this redemption, that he paid the price for us. 
And notice he adds here the forgiveness of sins. We have been forgiven of all our sins in Christ. We have been pardoned, if you will. Pointed out before the difference between clemency and pardon. You know, on the Old Testament was more like clemency. Their, their sins were kind of taken away, but they weren't really taken away. They were still on their record, if you will. They were rolled over for a while. But in Christ, they've been completely removed from us. Our slate has been wiped clean, if you will. Then we'll notice chapter 5, verse 2. Let me add one other thought while we were there. Uh, goes along with this too, but under the law, a sin offering had to be offered to receive forgiveness of sins. Leviticus 4 and chapter 4 and chapter 5 tell us that. So Christ was our sin offering, that we might have forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 5 verse 2 says, And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice of God for a sweet-smelling savor. Christ so loved us that he gave his life for us. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Mm -hmm. If no one else has done that, Christ certainly did that. Right. We sacrificially lived his life for us, and then in death he sacrificially gave his life for us. <laughs> and even in resurrecting, he did it for us. Yeah, yeah. But it says... It was for a sweet-smelling savor to God. We saw that phrase used in Leviticus. It means that it was a, you know, a pleasant fragrance or smell to God. It was pleasing to God. And certainly Christ and his sacrifice and offering was pleasing to God. In fact, uh, Isaiah 53 says, You shall see the travail of a soul and shall be satisfied. It was more than just pleasing to him. It completely satisfied him. We see this sweet-smelling savor in the burnt offering, the meat offering, the peace offering, and the sin offering for the common people. <laughs> and Christ was all those things for us. Let's go on to Philippians. <laughs> I feel like I've got another hour's worth of material I'd like to go over here. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 say, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of sinful or made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto the death, or excuse me, unto death, even the death of the cross. So here we see God was, as he calls it here, being form of God, thought not to be equal with God, thought not robbery to be equal with God. He was God. He was equal with the Father, as he often said me, or I and my Father are one. But he took on the form of sinful flesh, or as he says here, the likeness of men. And he became a servant. And he didn't come as a mighty king or a wealthy man, but just simply as a servant. <laughs> I know the, the Jews, they were expecting Messiah to come and be a some mighty king that was going to restore the kingdom and take it back from their enemies. Spiritually, he did that. And they were not looking for one to save them from their sins. It says he was obedient. He was submissive, if you will, to unto death. It says even the death of the cross. But he became obedient. He learned obedience, I think is how Hebrew says it. He experienced this obedience. He completely submitted himself to whatever death that was given to him, which was the death of the cross. One of the most horrific deaths he could have died. Right. Let's go on to Colossians here. We'll move on along. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. It says, Giving thanks unto the Father... Which hath made us to, or excuse me, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who had delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, 
in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Verse 14, we see again, we have redemption and forgiveness through him. This seems to be a recurring theme, doesn't it? That's because that was the problem. We needed to be redeemed from our sins. We need to be forgiven of our sins. But notice verse 13, he says, Who had delivered us from the power of darkness? We were in darkness before God saved us, before he rescued us, if you will. Darkness always represents evil and wickedness. And God always is represented as light. <laughs> Christ was delivered to the power of darkness for us, it says in Leviticus, or excuse me, Luke twenty two, fifty three. Like I mentioned, everything that we deserve was put upon Christ. You can also see Second Corinthians four six. We won't turn there, but He delivered us from light in the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we were talking about darkness Sunday at Julian. Well, you've never known darkness till you've been a couple hundred feet down in a cavern over in East Tennessee with no lights on at nighttime. At that. Went, me and Heather went on a tour of Ruby Falls a couple of years ago at nighttime. They turned off all the lights to show you how dark it is. You can't see the tip of your nose or the rim of your glasses, a hand in front of your face. It's as pitch black as you can imagine. And so was the darkness that we were in before Christ saved us. But yet, God shed his light on us that we might be saved. Let's go on back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'd like to start changing our focus a little bit as we draw this to a close tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4 say, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. You know, the whole Old Testament pointed to Christ and his coming. His what he was fulfilled and her he was typified, if you will, in the sacrifices and the Passover and prophesied throughout the Psalms and Isaiah and other places. And that's just of his death. He's seen in type and prophecies many other times as well. He died for our sins though. He says here, for, like I said, it's always for our sins, not for his, not for just sin in general, but for our sins he died. Right. And I want us to know as verse 4 that he was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Christ did not stay in the grave, did he? Right. Psalm 16:10, we saw it said, Thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Well, Christ would not stay in the grave, but but yet a three day yet three days, as it was of the sign of Jonah in the whale's belly. Three days and three nights. <coughs> Christ was in the belly of the earth, he says, in Matthew twelve, thirty nine and forty. But yes, Christ died, but let us not leave him there, as he rose again the third day. Not only did he defeat death, he completely conquered it. Not only did he defeat sin, he completely conquered it as well. He he defeated the one that had power of death, but he also defeated death itself. Right. I'd like to turn back to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6 verses 9 through 10. And we'll look at verse 23 as well since it's pertinent to what we're talking about. Romans 6 verse 9 says, Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. Amen. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. He said he not only defeated the one who had the power of death, according to Hebrews chapter 2, but he says here he was raised from the dead, that he dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. Death had no power over him, if you will. And really has no power over us if we're in Christ. 
Revelation 118 says, I am he which liveth and was dead and is alive forevermore. Amen. Well, Christ died, but he only died once, didn't he? But now he lives, and he lives unto God, he says. He ever liveth. Well, Christ shall not die ever again. And that gives us great assurance that we in, in him shall never die either. Verse 23 of the same chapter says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Death is the payment for sin. Death is what's required for sin. But Christ paid the debt for us. As he says, he says, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I know physically this body will expire one day unless Christ returns in our lifetime. That's not real death, if I can say it that way. The death that it's speaking of here is primarily the separation from God for all of eternity. Right. Yeah, the body will die. It will be the soul and spirit will be separated from this physical body. This heart will stop beating. It will stop. We will take our last breath one day. Right. But the death of the saint is not like the death of the sinner. We have no no fear that one day we will be eternally separated from God, and one day we will be eternally damned, if you will. But in Christ we have life everlasting, eternal life as he calls it here. Let's look at verse or chapter fourteen, verse nine. We'll continue on in our thoughts. Romans 14, 9 says, For this end, or for this cause or purpose, if you will, Christ died, or both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. Well, Christ doesn't do anything halfway. Right. He died, but he also resurrected. As here, it says here he rose and revived. Mm -hmm. And he would have dominion or rule. That's what this word Lord means here. Overall, he is Lord of all Hebrews. I mean, excuse me, Acts 10 says he is Lord of both the dead and the living. He is the master, if you will. He is the ruler of all. Amen. Let's go on to 1 Thessalonians. We'll <laughs> draw this to a close very soon here. 1 Thessalonians 1 10. In chapter 5, we'll look at briefly here. We see this wrath that we spoke of earlier. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, there's his return, whom he hath raised from the dead, his resurrection, even Jesus, whom de which delivered us from the wrath to come. But when Christ, we have been rescued, if you will, delivered from the wrath to come, as we saw in Romans 5.9. Flip over to chapter 5 and verse 9 and 10. He says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us that whether we wake or sleep we should live together with him Amen. whatever this wrath is we will not endure it right. <laughs> he says we will obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ as <coughs> the salvation as I said was primarily to be saved from sin. There's a lot more that comes with that. He says he died for us. He didn't die for everyone, did he? He died for us, for his people. That whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. This is an obvious reference back to chapter 4. Speaking of the catching away. You know, whether we're alive when he returns or whether we're in a grave, yet we will live together with him for all of eternity. Let's go over to Titus. Titus chapter 2, verses 13 through 14. I know these are familiar scriptures. I know I like to look at this passage a lot. Titus 2, 13 through 14 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? 
that he might redeem us once again from all iniquity. That's from all our sins, all our violations of the law. And purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Amen. So Christ cleansed, not only did he give himself for us, but it says he redeemed us from all iniquity, from all our transgressions, from all our sins. And he purifies, he cleansed us, or he washed us, if you will, to be a peculiar people. Uh, this peculiar people implies to be strange or different, but what it means is that we are a special per possession of his. <laughs> and he says, zealous of good works. You know, I have a problem with people who are not really have no desire for good works. Right. I know we'll always be sinful in this flesh. I know we'll struggle with sin, but yet there ought to be desire to do what God has called us to do. I won't belittle that point, though. But seeing what Christ has done for us, it should drive us to serve him. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians 15 for our last scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 16 through 20. So I didn't want to leave off the resurrection, for it is important. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 16 through 20. Here Paul is dealing with those who say there is no resurrection. And he says, For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. It seems obvious, doesn't it? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ must not have been resurrected. Verse 17 says, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Romans 10, 9 tells us that to be saved, we must believe that God raised him from the dead. Raised him the third day, I think it says there. So if he doesn't raise, then we're believing in something that's not true. Our faith is useless then. It's a, based on a falsehood. And he says, ye are yet in your sins. If our faith is vain, then our sins have not been washed away. If, if our faith is vain, then we have not truly been saved. It says, then they which also which are asleep or are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Well, all those that have went on before us, so they're perished. They're not coming back to life again right. if Christ hasn't been raised. Verse 19 says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Well, we have a great hope in Christ, though, don't we? That glorious appearing that we just read about in Titus, that's at least part of our great hope, if not the main portion of it. Which Christ shall come again and receive us unto himself, and this mortal shall put on immortality, and this corruptible shall put on incorruption. To be finally delivered from sin forever. You know, if, if there was no resurrection, we would just simply die and be lost not really lost, but forgotten about forever. Just in the grave. Our soul would continue on, I believe. But <laughs> Well, Christ rose that we might have life eternal. Right. That he might, as we saw, have dominion over death. That it would no longer have dominion over him. Verse 20 here says, But now has Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Christ is certainly is risen from the dead. It's not as the Jews report that they stole his body away. Right. <laughs> but no, if there, if the tomb was still over there, it'd still be empty, I believe. Mm -hmm. He's become the first fruits of them that slept. And I believe Christ was the first one that rose from the dead unto eternal life. I guess if. <laughs> That will draw us to an end here tonight. Lord willing, next week we'll be looking at the sacrifice of Christ in the epistle to the Hebrews. And the whole theme of the Hebrews is how the Christ is better. <laughs> he had a better priesthood. He was better than the law. His sacrifice was better. Lord willing, we'll see all that next week. Right. Have any questions or comments before we close? All right. Well, thank you all. We're dismissed. <laughs>